Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me here on Industry Insider with the Surf Systems. I'm Timothy Go. This is the platform where we discuss the many different ways for businesses to take advantage of COVID-19 disruptions to upgrade to technologies available now to soften the impact of the pandemic on your company. And as always, you can take part at any time by leaving your questions and comments below. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, we saw groceries running out of essential goods as many people started stocking up on staples. The same scenarios played out in many restaurants that remained open during the lockdown periods. Some ran out of supplies to have everything on the menu available for customers to order, while others found themselves with fresh food that they were not able to sell or use because they were forced to close down during the lockdown. So today we will look at the challenges faced by the food and beverage industry. We will examine the supply chain issues that affected the steady flow of goods and how companies managed to minimize the impact and build resilience by using relevant technologies. In the next half hour, we will hear from Timothy DeCoster, Group Supply Chain Design and Planning Manager at global beverage company Asahi about demand issues as the COVID lockdown forced many pubs to suspend operations. And then Alice Steenland will be joining us. She's from the So Systems Chief Sustainability Officer, and she will talk about why companies need to reconceptualize sustainability to provide the company with a competitive edge. But before all of that, let's find out the current state of the food and beverage industry globally. Nine months or so into the pandemic now, and is the F&B industry seeing a turnaround? Joining me is John Ansley, the Vice President of Digital Engineering and Manufacturing at Cap Gemini. Cap Gemini is a global leader in digital transformation services. Hello, John. Uh, first of all, can you tell us your current reading of the F&B industry? Yeah, hi, Tim. Thanks for that. Yes, um, I think that the, the main uh, things affecting the, the food and beverage industry at the moment are really um, a need to uh, secure their cash flows. Uh, a lot of companies have been found uh, wanting in that area where they haven't had enough money to keep themselves going during this very difficult time. Uh, and then the, the second thing is really uh, understanding both their inbound and their outbound supply chains better to ensure that they can get the, uh, uh, the materials they need to create their products and that they can also get those products to market. As you mentioned, things like pub closures causing quite a, quite a, a difficulty or in fact, uh, grocery stores closing as well in different countries. So those, those are the areas that I think are, 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 have had the largest impact. So John, how did companies do you think uh, change to respond to the initial disruption? And do you think it was enough uh, to keep them uh, and the supply chain resilient in the future? Yeah, that's, a, that's another really interesting question. I think some of the, the great examples of, of companies pivoting and, and particularly if you think about the um, uh, the alcohol side of food and beverage, and you see, you know, many of the gin distilleries and and, and other companies, in fact, in cheese manufacturers uh, and others who pivoted to making hand sanitizer, so that they could actually continue to employ their people uh, and keep and secure that cash flow, um, and because they had the right equipment, but it it really did uh, come to a, a point where they needed to be able to sort of rethink, retool. Um, their, their supply chains both in and out because they, they were getting uh, slightly different um, materials coming in and the products that they were creating uh, needed to be sold uh, in a very different way to their traditional products. So John, what role will uh, you think technology play in enabling F&B companies to adapt their manufacturing capabilities? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of really interesting concepts around this, you know, this this idea of manufacturing in a box, you know, where you can do a pop up manufacturing. So how can you create a, a manufacturing site somewhere where there wasn't one before and how do you do it very, very quickly? So what are the blends of technologies that you can have together uh, that allow you to very, very rapidly, um, you know, start a, start a manufacturing site effectively? Um, the, the other things are the tools around monitoring your inbound and outbound supply chains. So understanding what 
you know, what the knock-on effect is from your suppliers to you. So being able to um, use technology to monitor what's coming or what's not coming, probably more importantly, and then also understanding how the um, how the outbound supply chain is affected and monitoring that through through technology and optimization. Um, so th those are areas which I think people have probably in the past not really paid attention to and are critical if you want to be able to uh, keep doing business when you have you know these enormous upheavals as we've been facing. All right, John, let's uh, talk about some of the key trends that uh, you're seeing that's, uh, you think, shaping the food and beverage industry as we move forward. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, as, as we've seen, you know, there's this uh, instant, constant demand that people have for, uh, for the product they want and when they want it. And I, I think a great example of that is, uh, is you know, all of the, um, the Uber Eats type capabilities that are out there. People want what they want when they want it. And, um, and I think that's happening now right across the food and beverage industry. You know, you see with, uh, you can get delivery of food, of alcohol, uh, you can get your full grocery list delivered to you and you can really personalize it down to exactly what you want. So the, the food and beverage industry needs to respond to this in a way that they start to uh, take some control over this and create a, um, a you know a personalization menu for the for the individual customers whether that customer is a, a company or an individual um, they need to be able to do that so they can more rapidly serve their customer in a way the customer wants to be served so that, that's that's one uh, one key area and, and you know the, the the technology sides of that are, are many and varied in term, in terms of you know getting data insights into who your customer is and what they what they're likely to want. Okay, well, we I've been uh, presented with various uh, platforms for this one, but uh, let me ask you this. What do you think will be uh, the key benefits for FMB companies to be able to forecast this kind of demand from their customers? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, really understanding the, the waves, and I think there's there's some companies that have done this really well in, in high, vol uh, high volume stores uh, where product is moving really, really rapidly through those stores. Um, they've been able to predict exactly what they want and when they want it. Now, when you move away from that store experience and you move to a, an on-demand experience uh, for the customer, for the consumer, you need to find a way of, of making that technology that used to be able to work quite nicely at a grocery store level, work at the individual level and then understand what the patterns are. And those patterns will change. Um, they won't be, it won't be the traditional, you know, everybody, everybody buys a chicken on Sunday type uh, um, you know, uh, experience. I think we're going to see some real changes there as people become, um, you know, they as the individuals decide exactly what and what they want and when they want it. So, taking all of that data, it's going to be a huge, big data exercise, and crunching that down into uh, an understanding of what you need to be manufacturing and what you need in both your inbound and outbound supply chains is key. Thank you very much for sharing your insights uh, with us, John. John Ansley is with Camp Gemini. Coming up next here on Industry Insider with the So System, how are drink and alcoholic beverage makers surviving when restaurant demand for their products are affected by limited business activities? We will find out when we return. Welcome back to Industry Insider with the So Systems. We are tracking the food and beverage supply chain today and learning how this can be made more resilient to unexpected disruptions. Let's hear now from the group supply chain design and planning manager of Asahi Beverages, Mr. Timothy DeCoster. Asahi Beverages is one of the leading drinks manufacturer in Australia and New Zealand. So Tim, can you tell us about how Asahi is adapting to the sudden disruption to their demand planning and also the closure of pubs and restaurants? Thanks for having me, Timothy. The closure of bars and restaurants definitely brought some uncertainty to our demand plan, especially that this was a state-driven decision and not necessarily a federal decision. And as such, there were some different opinions within the business on how this all would play out. So what we've decided is to go from our more um, traditional bottom-up demand plan to a top-down demand plan 
to ensure that we could make decisions with the best of the information we had at the time. These decisions were made with two guidelines. One was the safety of our people in the supply chain, so our warehouse and production sites, but also our salespeople who at the time were still driving um, to our customers. And secondly, we need to ensure that our customers would survive this sudden disruption of closing their bars and restaurants for a few months. We thought it was most appropriate to do this in protecting their cash flow, but also uh, ensuring that they kept in touch with their clientele while their bars um, were closed. So we had a few initiatives. One of the examples was for the love of your local, where we got a platform together that people could buy a beer in advance and when we matched the same beer. Um, so when the bars would eventually reopen and the people had one plus one free, but at the same time, the bars got some money in um, during the time they were shut down. Simultaneously, we revised payment terms and we um, paid back all of the full kegs that were still on site. And bringing back full kegs is not something that our supply chain is used to. So we needed to make quite some changes from our logistical control tower to changing our production lines to, uh, to empty kegs instead of full kegs so that and steel beer was then used with our bioreactors to create energy to run those plants. So Tim, can you uh, share with us some of the ways that uh, Asahi is tackling the increasing complexity in this product mix? And also, how do you grow this range of products? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The uh, um, portfolio is ever expanding. Just uh, about 10 years ago, 90% of our volume was coming just from a handful of products. But since then, we've made a conscious decision to move into craft and new categories such as ginger beers and organic beers. So simultaneously, our customers are expected to be delighted and to have a more diverse portfolio and range in the store. And we're trying to adapt to that by changing the layout of our warehouses to be able to efficiently and effectively deliver those products. At the same time, we're making sure that from a commercial sense that we're tracking our innovations and our products and be able to kill our darlings to uh, delete these products and put new innovations in place. And we have an IP process to ensure that actually happens. Well, since you brought up uh, IBP, Tim, what are some of the examples for Asahi in, uh, in adopting for integrated business planning in terms of uh, process and functional integration, especially when it comes to supply chain and logistics? Yeah, right now we're actually moving from the more traditional SNOP to the IBP cycle. And to make sure that that transition happens sustainably, we're first focusing on people where we give training to make sure people understand what the difference is and what their role in that process is. But simultaneously, we're supporting the process with uh, plenty of software on the tactical, the strategic, and also the operational level. On the operational level, for example, we use the logistical control tower to have real-time visibility on our supply chain, which I believe in this ever-changing world is no longer a bad of an edge. It is needed to survive. It's really nice talking to somebody with the same name here, Timothy DeCoster from Asahi Beverages. Asahi Beverages, of course, makes quality alcohol and non-alcoholic drinks. Some of them you probably have in your refrigerators right now. There's more to come after the break. When we return, find out how the So Systems 3D Experience platform can help you if you want to work collaboratively across the value chain. Stay with us. While consumers drive new trends, in the design and experience of packaging, product packaging workflows have remained unchanged for decades. Every step from sourcing to coordination, design, manufacturing, and logistics lives in silos. Continuing on this path is not sustainable, not in an industry with ever-increasing demands, but product packaging can be developed and delivered in a more sustainable way. Sustainability need not be a struggle, even when consumers want more. If done the right way, sustainability can help you deliver value to consumers, the environment, and your bottom line. In the circular economy, imagine 
if you could close the loop to connect all your value contributors and drive sustainable packaging processes. Goals like biodegradability, compostability, or recyclability can be managed with material science tools to determine the post-consumption experience at the start. Want to see how the product package will look and behave in the real world? You can design and simulate it collaboratively with powerful digital tools. And can packaging workflows become faster and more agile? Absolutely. You can coordinate workflow stakeholders in real time to manage projects and inventories. Then determine the most efficient route for your packaging to get to the customer, even when conditions change. That's fewer miles, a smaller carbon footprint, faster time to market, more environmentally friendly designs, and lower costs. For a sustainable planet, society, and business, you need to close the loop with the 3D Experience platform. You're watching Industry Insider with the So Systems. Now that we've heard how some F&B companies managed to outsmart the disruption and even found opportunities going forward, it is time to learn how technology can help companies on the road to being more sustainable and resilient in challenging times. So with me now is the So Systems Chief Sustainability Officer, Alice Steenland. Thanks for joining us, uh, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Alice, we've heard from previous interviews on uh, improving business efficiency. How does efficiency relate to sustainability? Mm, it's a great question. Um, a lot of things we can do in manufacturing and industry and operations and in business in general about improving efficiency are exactly aligned with the sustainability agenda. So anything that has to do with reducing inputs, um, so reducing the amount of resources consumed, uh, reducing the amount of energy needed, reducing the amount of space needed, uh, all of these things have direct implications for lightening uh, the corporate footprint, as we say, the environmental footprint of a corporate operation. Um, so there really is a lot of overlap between the two topics, which is great for the sustainability agenda um, and, and also for the efficiency agenda, I think, now too. So Alice, when it comes to uh, sustainability, though, how should businesses navigate towards a more sustainable, yet very important, cost-effective operation? Mm -hmm. Well, in the examples I just gave, um, it, clearly there's a, a complete alignment between the two. And I think uh, I think that's that's very has always been and is still very often the case, which is if you consume fewer resources, you are more cost efficient and you happen to be more sustainable as well. I think what's happening a little bit is that the equation is sort of shifting, which is that there's a lot of regulatory and consumer pressure on increasing the sustainability of the way we produce and manufacture and consume goods globally. Uh, and these pressures are, are sort of pushing corporates quicker than maybe they would have uh, gone before to start thinking about um, beyond just the optimization angle, how can I sort of radically make more sustainable my operations? And sometimes that does require an upfront cost. Um, a lot of times when you do like ROI, a lot of the companies we work with are in this game for the long term. And when you when you make a new product or you make a new manufacturing design uh, that has implications for the way your plants run and the way they're designed. And so all of these are very heavy and, and complicated decisions. If you run the ROI calculations over a long period of time, uh, very often you start to see that uh, the same alignment between the sustainability agenda and the cost efficiency agenda. That's true for things like the energy efficiency of buildings, which often takes an upfront investment. Um, but if you calculate over a five-year plan, usually you're going to recuperate that investment because the cost of energy, uh, regulation around energy, all of this is changing. It's changing the calculations companies are making today. And I think that's a really interesting um, it's a really interesting context in which a lot of uh, leading companies are seeing a huge opportunity for innovation. Which takes us to a topic that is very interesting, I'm sure for many of our viewers as well today, the circular economy. It is gaining a lot of momentum now and uh, with, with uh, manufacturers expected to minimize waste and pollution by design. 
Can you explain this concept of circular economy? <laughs> uh, yes, and that's where a lot of the, the disruption is coming from and will come from. So it's a really exciting innovation opportunity. Um, so to explain what it is, maybe it's helpful to explain what it's not. So what, what we say um, about the economy today is that it is a take, make, waste economy. So we take resources from the environment we make things with them, and then essentially we throw that away. Almost everything we make is thrown away, be it a building or a plastic bottle or whatever, at some point is thrown away. So in the best of cases, we can recycle that. Um, but that's usually not the case in most countries and in mo with most types of materials. So we are in a situation where we're taking, uh, we're taking, making, and wasting. And the idea is to say, how can, instead of this line, how can we make this a circle? So how can the waste from one process feed in as an input into creating new objects and new things that we need so that you essentially close the resource loop um, and are able to therefore build a more sustainable economy. So we know that we are running out of a lot of uh, basic materials. We know that the extraction of these materials uh, causes pollution that is making our climate uh, uh, in unlivable, basically. Um, so how can we close this loop and stop this cycle? And that's where a lot of the innovation is coming from. So uh, new materials that can be more easily broken down, that can be biodegradable, new materials that can be 100% recycled, new processes that can pull these uh, materials into the manufacturing loops more easily, uh, public-private partnerships where you have uh, corporates and governments working together to build these systems of uh, resource reuse. Um, and all of that is happening right now. It's being pushed uh, in some, to some extent by uh, consumer uh, demand and corporate awareness, also a lot by regulation. There's circular economy regulation uh, coming into play in Europe that's going to be very, um, uh, it's really going to push a lot of innovation. It's going to be very significant in the changes it's going to make. This idea of extended uh, manufacturer liability is built within that, which means essentially we're moving towards a model where you make it, you own it. So you make something, um, you own the whole life cycle of that object. So in some way or another, you're going to have to understand and manage the end of life of whatever you've built. And that's that's sort of where the economy is headed. And that means a lot of opportunity for a lot of companies who take the lead on this. Okay, so talking about that managing the end of life for the product that you're manufacturing, I also found out uh, that in the process of, for example, recycling something for future use or trying to uh, source out new new materials, there's a lot of environmental impact on, on that process as well. So how does a company yeah. balance things out in, in such a way that they can recycle without really harming uh, yeah. the environment that they're supposed yeah. to be protecting? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the tricky thing. So there's a lot of innovation in the field of new materials and recycling new techniques and all these sorts of things. Everything has consequences, right? Everything has, uh, uh, and some of them are unintended consequences that are not things we would have liked to have seen. So uh, we at uh, DASA Systems are trying to work on a full life cycle analysis approach, which is that whatever process you're building or whatever product you're building, you're not just looking at one aspect. Like you're not only looking at the CO2 implications. You're also looking at the full life cycle of that manufacturing process or that product. And so how uh, how does it impact toxicity? How does it impact human health? How does it impact water resources? And so I think that 360 view is really important when thinking, especially when investing in changes that, that are significant for your company. Um, and so that's that's the approach that we're taking. Um, some of these things, it's like any innovation. Uh, some of these things we, we won't fully understand until we're farther down the path. I do think that, I mean, that's given how fast things are changing. You know, people used to say, well, uh, there's no point. Um, there's no point in moving towards renewable energy because we'll never have the batteries we need to store it, right? But look at how everything is changing. Look at how the dynamics and the economics of all these things are changing. So uh, there's a real argument for trying some innovation that you think is going to make a positive impact, uh, even if the full system around it is not ready. Um, because the, we've had, we have enough proof points now to show that we're moving generally in the right direction, uh, that innovation in this space is, uh, is helping to push sort of on all levers at the same time. We have very little time to, um, sort of 
save the planet. Basically, we have a very we're hitting planetary boundaries very quickly, so we have very little time. And a lot of the experts will tell you, uh, push as hard as we can on all levers, and we will hope for a moonshot. Basically, Alice, let's specifically talk about the beverage industry, the drinks industry, and bottling. How does a company improve the way, environmentally improve the way they uh, package their drinks in such a way that we don't waste so much plastic? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a, sort of the million dollar question right now. There are lots of folks working on innovations in this space. Um, there's the stuff that we know uh, and that, for example, Dasso Systems does uh, very well with a lot of our customers, which is um, about taking an existing model and sort of lightweighting it so you're using much less material to make it. Um, uh, changing the shape slightly so that you can fit more onto uh, trucks, which then make your logistics impact in terms of CO2 lighter. Um, uh, different uh, sort of techniques like that that have a lot to do, to do with this sort of efficiency and sustainability concept. Some of the more disruptive ideas that people are working on uh, have to do with um, completely rethinking materials. Uh, so you all might have seen some of these like algae balls that you basically swallow. Um, so eliminating the need for packaging because you're sort of eating the package itself. Um, you've also seen uh, some examples, like for John, Johnny Walker recently uh, switched its bottles to be, um, uh, or have, have done some experimentation around uh, paper bottles, which then are uh, take less energy to produce and are uh, entirely sort of biodegradable and recyclable. So the, those, the new material space is really exciting and really interesting. And then you have this other version of the circular economy model where you get rid of packaging altogether and you have a, a, an experience-based economy, which is like we, what we like to say at Desa Systems, an experience-based economy, where essentially you are using the product but without the packaging. And you have seen some coalitions um, with Unilever and some other big brands working together uh, to create systems, um, essentially like delivery systems, which now we use for everything, where someone would come to your house with your groceries. Um, and each time they come and bring you new groceries, they're essentially taking the packaging back with them. Um, so it's a zero packaging um, type of uh, uh, environment and and those are those are uh, just at the early stages of experimentation in some markets um, you also have package free stores in the UK for example there's no packaging in the store everything is available but uh, with your own packages or reusable packaging um, so all of this is at early stages but this is sort of the direction that the circular economy is going to go in and when you think about it this is actually how we used to buy and consume goods the sort of explosion in packaging is relatively recent it's with just within the last couple of decades. We used to have models and we used to run our economy without all this packaging. So, so the first thing you do in being more sustainable is about reduction and then reuse and then recycling. So reduction is, is sort of the hot topic these days. Okay, speaking of that, as you were mentioning, like decades ago, we were buying things, you know, in bulk, right? Or, or, or no packaging, even up to the 90s in the supermarkets. But then packaging came along because of sanitary reasons, right? And now we're faced with this COVID-19 again, and more policies are being put in place to make sure everything is packed and sanitized. And we're seeing it here in Singapore, for example. So how does one yeah. balance that out? Yeah, yeah, that has been uh, a big concern amongst the sustainability profession, which is that, you know, COVID-19 in some ways has led to huge amounts of innovation around sustainability, but in other ways, maybe is we're taking a step backwards. And some of the most ambitious legislation on single-use plastics in some countries has been halted uh, because of the pandemic. I think that's when the concept of biomaterials comes into play um, and recycling systems that uh, function. Um, so that's it's actually pretty rare today to have very sophisticated um, uh, recycling structures and uh, and these are ways where you can have hygiene standards um, uh, protected but using alternative materials or using all materials that you know can be uh, reused re recycled somehow um, or disposed of responsibly um, I think there's also a question I mean the, the for example there was there's a little bit of controversy 
around um, uh, the fact that some, some of the single-use plastic, for example, legislation was uh, slowed down due to, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, concern about COVID. Uh, because if you look at some of the actual scientific research on it, um, if you use, for example, paper packaging, it's not more conducive to the spread of the virus than is plastic. So I think that's when you, we really need to challenge the materials that are being used and ask ourselves, does it have to be single use? And maybe in the pandemic it does, but does it have to be single use plastic? Maybe not. Alice, uh, what are the solutions though that the SO systems can provide now or how far along are you in that process of completing that 360 uh, mm -hmm. options that you were talking about? Yeah, so we have so we have um, some solutions that we are um, uh, very excited about, and that we are hoping to get into our customers' hands very quickly. That include this sort of three hundred and sixty life cycle analysis approach. Um, we have lots of other tools which many of our customers are already using around uh, the, the first equation, the efficiency. A lot of what SO Systems does is about how do you reduce the amount of resources you need to build something, the time invested, uh, the energy, the how do you reduce water impacts. A lot of that is already built into the way, what, basically the, the core offer of what SO Systems um, gives to our customers. Um, what we're trying to do now is to add this layer of of how do you help our customers um, be more sustainable by design? So within the very early stages of imagining a new industrial process or a new product, uh, embed this idea of life cycle analysis, embed this idea of design for recyclability, design, design for end of life, and those are all things that we're we're really um, actively working on and are are already piloting some exciting stuff with some customers. Sounds good. So, Alice, uh, in these times of uncertainty, is this a good time, you think, for companies to start to rethink their operations? Yeah, I actually think it's a wonderful time. And in some ways, the obviously, the the sort of turmoil recently in the economy due to the pandemic um, has been a, a, a terrible challenge and at the same time has really raised awareness um, about the connection, our connectedness to the natural world, I think. And that um, has, uh, you can see that in the financial market. So huge inflows into more sustainable companies, what we call ESG investing, explosion in ESG investing since the beginning of the pandemic, and more and more companies taking very, very bold announcements, um, uh, making very bold announcements of Unilever and Danon and Microsoft and sort of the, the large iconic uh, brands in the world are all saying, this is a crisis and we are going to rethink completely the way we run our businesses. Um, we're going to look at our whole supply chain. We're going to look at how we source everything. We're going to reduce that impact um, in terms of CO2 to zero as fast as we can. These are um, very ambitious sustainability goals, but these are also hugely ambitious innovation goals. And I think if you look historically uh, at patterns in innovation, um, periods of crisis have always led to huge periods of innovation. So every economic dip has been followed by an explosion in innovation. I think that's what we're experiencing now. And the theme of this cycle's innovation is sustainability. Well, one would hope this will push us through the next uh, level. Alice, thank you very much for joining us here. The thank Social you. Chief Sustainability Officer, Alice Steenland, uh, with us here on In Industry Insider. Well, we've come to the end of this week's live stream. And of course, we will try our best to answer all the questions and the comments you left below. Join us again on the next Industry Insider with the SO Systems, where we will explore new ways to do business and learn from those who managed to take this time of disruption and found opportunities for the future. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of the afternoon.